Hey there, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Josh, and tonight I am here joined uh, by Emily, the curator at the Elvin Polisok Museum um, here in Winter Park, Florida. Um, we are here today for the 60th anniversary archive tour, and she's going to show us some really cool uh, artifacts that haven't really been seen at the museum before. Um, before we get into the event, I just wanted to let you all know that this project was made part possible in part by the Institute of Museum and Library Sciences Services. Uh, thank you very much to them for providing the cameras and everything that we're using today. Um, so like I said, before we get started, um, if you have any questions throughout the event, and we do encourage questions where we want to know what you guys know about the museum and what you had questions about, so please post those in the comments. We will be reading them throughout the events, and uh, we will get to try to get to all or most of your questions. So please post those in the comments below. And without any further ado, allow me to introduce Emily, uh, the curator at the Polisec Museum. Oh. Hi, everybody. Sorry, I have purple gloves on so that I can pick things up. Um, so thank you for joining us. Josh, thanks for inviting us to do this. No, thank you so um, much. Of course. So uh, just a little background. So this year is our 60th anniversary of the Polisec Museum. Um, it was founded in 1961 by Alvin and his second wife, Emily. And um, unfortunately, we were hoping we could be in the historic home tonight, but because of some technical issues, we've moved it to Cape and House. So you might get to see some shots of the house that's never open to the public because it's an event space and it's our staff offices. Um, but because our archives are currently kind of being overhauled, we're digitizing, and it's a very small space. We opted to pull some of the pieces that have never been seen, never been displayed, as well as a couple pieces that have, so that everybody gets to see them. And like Josh said, please ask questions. If you have questions, that's what I'm here for. Um, trust me, you don't wanna just listen to me drone on for a half hour, 45 minutes. <laughs> um, so yeah, we can get started. Thank you so much and I'll uh, leave it up yeah. to you. Have a good one. Awesome. Okay, so um, we have this, we set this lovely table up in uh, Cape Inn and it has uh, some of the pieces that have never really been displayed. Um, the first one, which Caitlin, our lovely camera woman is heading towards is the letter. Okay, no, go to the picture. So this picture actually, um, I don't know how many people Gen, I'm going to do it anyways. I don't know how many Gen Z are joining us tonight, but we joke that the picture of Albin is our thirst picture. Go ahead and zoom up on Albin. Um, Albin was actually uh, in, he was born in Moravia, which is now in the Czech Republic in 1879 on Valentine's Day. And um, that picture of him was when he was essentially a gymnast. They had something called a Sokol. And it was a gym where the mostly men would go and work out, but they were pretty much like Olympic level gymnasts. Um, so that lovely picture of Albin's very muscular arm is kind of a staff favorite. We actually have it blown up and it used to be in the historic home. Um, and it's a gelatin silver print. Unfortunately, a lot of the photographs that we have in our archives were in a scrapbook at one time, and they weren't necessarily removed very carefully. Um, so a lot of them in here, I can get up and show you. A lot of them, well, they're very fragile. They're damaged because of the way that they were removed from the book. And then, of course, some of them have labels on the back, most of them don't, but you can see where they were pretty much ripped off the page. And that's why when you look at the front of it, you kind of see the backing paper along the top there. Another piece that we pulled that um, I actually forgot we had until this morning is this letter. It was written by Edwin A. Russell. Uh, his daughter, Emily, was one of Alvin's students. Um, she came to, she was looking for a sculpture instructor and she basically came to Alvin for private lessons and he befriended the family. Um, he was living in New York City at the time in 1916. And um, Edwin Russell, who was the vice president of the Otis Elevator Company, 
was really good friends with a lot of the board members over at the Art Institute of Chicago. So um, the former chair of the head of the sculpture department had passed away and they were looking for someone to take his place. Well, Russell suggested Albin. And this is the letter where he is essentially offering Albin this job and saying, would you please come to Chicago and meet um, Mr. Uh, I think it's Vander Shaw or well, Mr. Shaw and a couple of the other board members that he was friends with. And would you even be willing to come out here because they're gonna offer you this job if you come out to Chicago? Well, luckily Albin went to Chicago and um, in 1916, he became the head of the sculpture department at the Art Institute of Chicago, where he stayed for almost 30 years um, before he retired and built his home in Winter Park. Um, so that was something that it's just really interesting to see the letters that we have and it's just the little pieces of history that gives so much more dimension to Albin as a person. Excuse me, because the stories are just so much better when you have these kind of tactile artifacts. Um, something else that is really neat, as I said, Alvin was from the Czech Republic. And um, so when he left, he left the Czech Republic in 1901. He had two brothers who were already living in the United States. And um, one of them, Robert, when he came home for Christmas one year said to Alvin, come to the States with me, have, make a fresh start, come live with me you know, we'll get you out of your home country. Um, he'd had some issues with some of the apprenticeships that he was doing. So Alvin was born with a love to travel. And the, what Caitlin is currently zooming in on is Alvin's 1930 passport application. Um, he became a U.S. citizen in 1909, and we'll pan over that in a couple minutes. Um, but this is Alvin's handwritten application. I see a question about Radagast. Radagast was not the thing that was destroyed. Um, there was a monument of Woodrow Wilson that was erected at the end of World War I because Wilson was an integral part of the creation of Czechoslovakia. And um, he was honored in that way, Albin created a huge monument to Woodrow Wilson. And during World War II, when the Nazis invaded, they tore down the sculpture and essentially destroyed it. And it was thought for a long time that um, it was completely gone. Well, it turns out one of the men that was supposed to have destroyed the head actually hid it away and I believe it was a barn and it came to our attention, this man was very, very old. Um, it came to the attention of artists and organizations. So they went and they found this bust and it was recast. There were a group of Czech artists that got together and they recreated the Wilson Monument. And it currently stands in front of the um, train station in Prague. So if you ever get to Prague, which someday I hope to, go see it. We used to have a maquette on display of it, a little plaster version, and we used to have um, a plaster recreation of the bust uh, that was painted bronze. Um, and those things are currently in storage. Things get rotated off display in the house a lot, um, especially for our 60th anniversary. Um, if you can't tell from how quickly I talk, I get distracted easily, so I tend to find things in archives or in the collection. And I just go into the house and I switch it out for something else. So that's kind of what we did with Wilson. Um, since we're talking about Prague in the Czech Republic, um, next to Alvin's passport application is one of his passports. So this was something that I just thought was absolutely adorable. Um, Alvin was five foot four. He was not a very tall man. Um, but he was, from all accounts that I've read and letters and things, everyone just absolutely loved him. So I'm going to get up for a second and I can show you his passport picture. So this is obviously his United States passport. 
And you can see he was born in Czechoslovakia, February 14th, 1879. He's a sculptor. Do this very carefully. And just like our passports, they have stickers and stamps. Um, I kind of like the way they used to stamp over the picture. They don't quite do that anymore. And that's his signature, which you still have to do if you have a passport. Um, but he's got stamps from the countries that he visited and the dates. And something that's really awesome about historical records, especially with um, things like Ancestry.com, you can now track these people. So um, because of, like I said, Ancestry.com, I've been able to not only track Alvin through where we know he traveled, um, but now we can even say he was on this ship from New York to London on this date. So, I mean, it is really, things like that have become very, very helpful. I'm really glad that things like that exist now. So right underneath his passport, so I mentioned he became a United States citizen. He was naturalized, I should say, in 1909. Uh, when he became a US citizen, he was studying at uh, the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, I'm from central Pennsylvania. Uh, I worked at a museum there. We call it PAFA. So people are always asking me when I say PAFA, what am I talking about? I don't even they realize I'm doing it. Um, so this is really cool because they stamped in, of course, where everything was happening. But right down here, his name. So on the 17th of February, 1909, Alvin became a United States citizen. And this was a really big deal for him, having come from a country that was so oppressed. And actually, um, this went on to play a huge role in his life and his career. Um, and in 1939, he was honored by the National Institute for Immigrant Welfare. And this is the, a copy of the speech that he gave when he was given that award. And this is actually one of my favorite pieces in the archives. It has a quote that we use pretty much for everything. Um, and he's praising his love for America and how he's so glad that he was able to come to this country and the opportunities that it afforded him. And um, one of the most famous lines, like I said, we use this on a lot of our marketing, is in the heart of Czechoslovakia, a piece of rock broke off from the Carpathian Mountains. Later, this crude stone was transported to the land of the free, the United States of America. And he is referring to himself, and it's poignant because Alvin was a sculptor. He worked with stone. Most of his pieces uh, that we have on property are bronze, but he carved stone, and he was incredible. And it also really plays into something that I, realize, you know, I don't have out here, is his most famous piece, Man Carving His Own Destiny. And that piece was actually, and that's what, um, when Josh had the welcome screen up, that photograph is Alvin working on Man Carving. And that piece was really a metaphor for himself, and he was carving his own destiny by coming to the United States, and he was given his opportunities. Um, Another cool thing that we brought out in 1910, while Alvin, Alvin was a student at PAFA, he won the coveted Prix de Rome Fellowship, which allowed him three years of study at the American Academy in Rome. And this, I didn't know this existed until the other day, this is Alvin's card. You can see his picture, he's a very handsome man. Um, and it's actually really neat. At first I thought it was his student ID. It's actually, a card in Italian that allows him entry to all of the museums and galleries in Rome. As a student of sculpture, my Italian's really rusty, um, he was able to get this pass, which let him get into all those places for, for free, and he got this in his second year, well, yeah, his, about his second year of his fellowship, 
July 9, 1912 was when it was given to him. And it was good until November of that year. And here he signed it saying he agreed to all the rules. And then the issuer or the minister has to sign it as well so that it's valid. And as I mentioned, Alvin was a prolific sculptor, an incredible artist. Um, and that's shown not only in his work, but in the accolades that he received. One of the accolades that he received is something that rarely ever is displayed. Um, it is the George Widener Gold Medal. This was given to Alvin in 1914, 1915, I apologize. Um, he won it for his piece, Aspiration. And the Widener Medal was created in memory of George Widener by his family. The Widener's were a big deal in Philadelphia. They made a lot of money to pass up. And this was a memorial award. Uh, George Widener died in the sinking of the Titanic. So Alvin has a few connections to the Titanic. There's this, and he also lost a very good friend and the chief of really the American Academy of Rome, Francis Millet. They both passed away in the Titanic disaster. And um, kind of a running joke around here is I did my master's thesis on Titanic and her passengers um, when I was doing my museum studies master's. And um, I've been studying Titanic since I was 13. So when I started here and found out that we not only have the Millet bust, but we have this medal, which honors of Someone who's lost in the disaster as well. I was very, it's morbid, but I was very excited about it. But you can see there's a little portrait of George. It says the George D. Widener Memorial Medal. And this was created by Albert Lysel. Or Lysel. He was um, a sculptor like Alvin. He did a lot of metal work, a lot of metal designs. Um, this award was first given in 1913, a year after George was lost. So Alvin was one of the first to really receive it. And others who got it were Charles Grafley, a respected professor at PAFA, sculptor, one of uh, Alvin's mentors, uh, Paul Manship, and other really big names at that time. Unfortunately, it was discontinued in the 1960s. Um, and you'll actually find some of these medals floating around on the and auction sites. Um, it is 14 karat gold, sorry, no, it is 24 karat solid gold, and that's why it's rarely on display. It was out in April. I brought it out for what I was dubbing Titanic Week. The entire week leading up to April 15th and April 15th, this was out on display in the store home for visitors to see. So we're going to deviate for a second. So this picture is of Alvin working on a bust of Eleanor Eckhart. Eleanor was the daughter of Percy Eckhart, who was a trustee at the Art Institute of Chicago. He and Alvin became very good friends and very fast friends. And um, they kind of accepted Alvin into their family. And Alvin loved their children. They had three daughters. Um, and he did busts of all of them. But this one is of Eleanor. So this is Alvin posing with the clay bust of Eleanor. And if I can do this without making anybody sick, since we're in Cabin, if you can follow without making anybody sick. Sorry to, to break in here. It's kind of tough to hear you. I believe the uh, the laptop is picking you up. Uh, just in this back room, especially, it's a little tough. Oh, no worries. Thank you. 
I forgot I'm tethered. I forgot I'm tethered. Um, but I just wanted to show the uh, final finished product, the bronze of um, Eleanor Eckhart, which we have on display in the Cape and House. Um, it was done in 1918. Um, and Caitlin zooming in again on that gelatin silver print of Albin standing with the finished clay model. And actually, since I'm talking about the Eckhart, uh, Kate, if you back up a little bit. So another piece that's on display. Um, so Charlotte Capen, the mother was, well, Charlotte Eckhart was a Capen. Um, her uncle was the man who built this house. And um, so when we purchased the Capen house and moved it to the property, we had that connection with Albin, which was perfect. Um, what you're seeing right now is, uh, she's always on display. This is Elizabeth. Excuse me, she's the youngest daughter of Charlotte and Percy. And this piece was done in 1920, it's called Elizabeth. And it was originally created to be a fountain for Elizabeth's grandparents. And it sat in their home in their, uh, they had like a, an atrium area where the fountain sat. Um, but it's little Elizabeth, she was about six years old when he sculpted this. Um, and she modeled for him. Her parents would take her over to his studio and she'd model for a few hours. Well, she came down with measles while he was working on this. Um, so even though she was sick, uh, she would show up and model. And then um, he added the bird on her hand a little bit later. She didn't actually hold the bird while she was modeling for him. And you can see she's very, um, I think of her, she has that kind of Grecian style to her, the very classical sculpture, which Alvin was known for. And you can see that in the soft drapery of the little dress that she has on. Um, but she, unfortunately, it's getting dark now, but you can still kind of see it during the day when it's really bright outside, you get that gorgeous light right behind her. And I, I love coming in here and seeing her. She's adorable. Um, but I digress, back to the table. Uh -huh. So another piece that we brought out is Eternal Moment. So we have a couple Eternal Moments on property. There's the concrete one that's out in the garden by the lake. Um, we have a marble version on display in the historic home right now. And then we have about six plaster versions as well. And these were little maquettes that were done about 1964. So as Albin aged, he passed away in 1965. Um, shortly after retiring to Winter Park in 1950, he had a stroke which left him completely paralyzed on the left side of his body. Um, he was still amazingly able to paint, able to sculpt, and um, he just continued that throughout the rest of his life. But Eternal Moment was a huge piece for him. It was considered one of his most powerful works. Um, it illustrates two lovers passionately embracing um, young love. It could, some people think it's kind of inspired by Rodin's uh, Eternal Springtime, which was done in 1886. Uh, but it was, people absolutely loved it. It was acclaimed. Um, it never really won awards, but um, it was one of his best known pieces and one that always sold. So as Albin got older, he tended to make little plaster versions of some of his work that was well known or well received, and he would give them out as gifts. So we have about six of these little plaster versions in our collection. Um, because they're plaster and they are so fragile, they do stay in storage. Um, I think in February this year, I brought one of them out and put it on display because it was February and Valentine's Day. Um, but it's just such a sweet moment. And you can see again, like the classical sculpture, the anatomy of the human form that Alvin was really known for and that he embraced in the majority of his work. And Alvin, you can kind of see it with this, you can see it with all of his work. He really believed that sculpture should be made to be seen in the round. So all of his work 
is created to be beautiful from all angles. Excuse me. He, um, when he got into an argument one time with another artist who said, as basically, as long as it's pretty in the front, that's all that matters. Um, so Albin created Aspiration, which is what won him the Widener Medal, uh, to prove that a sculpture should be beautiful 360. And even though this is a little plaster version, you can see that as well, that it's meant to be seen from all angles. And the lines, it, it's just beautiful from all angles. And we're getting down to the last couple. Um, so Albin, obviously, as an artist, all artists draw, even if they don't like it, they're forced to do it at some time. And Albin, like everyone else, was forced to take drawing classes and painting classes in school. But he continued to do preliminary drawings throughout the rest of his career. He also continued to do um, Sketches, he did a lot of anatomy sketches when he was at PAFA. That was the requirement, that was the class. Um, they really had to understand the human form so that they could sculpt, paint, or draw the human form accurately. So even throughout his career later in life, Albin would still practice these basic techniques. And since he was the head of the sculpture department, he was most likely really trying to ingrain in his students that these fundamental elements are incredibly important to their work, especially when it comes to sculpture, because you have to understand the body and muscles and everything so that you can accurately portray it. I just, I saw a question about the cost and prevalence of bronze casting compared to when Albin was sculpting? It's a really good question. Um, it's all relative, really. Um, obviously, the size of a sculpture um, and the intricacy of the sculpture definitely plays a role in it. Um, when Albin was having things cast, uh, some of the smaller pieces, uh, he was getting payments of a few hundred to a few thousand dollars is what he was charging for things. And to this day, there to have something cast like that, it's pretty relative. Um, it's a little bit more expensive, but that's just because things have become more expensive over time. Um, the biggest issue with cost and casting was in World War II, Albin was working on a piece. It was the Masaryk Memorial in Chicago. And he started it about 1929. Um, and he continued to work on it. But because of World War II, the foundries were starting to shut down, especially in Chicago. And he was forced to pretty much stop working on it. The first few pieces of it, it was strategically cut into 22 pieces to be cast. And um, the first few pieces were cast, but then everything just stopped. All the foundries were shifted to producing things for the war effort. So um, Albin, because he kind of saw what was coming, he bought all of the bronze that was going to be necessary to cast this thing in the early 1930s. Well, being the patriotic American citizen that Alvin was, when the foundry started closing, he donated all of the bronze that he had left over to cast the Masaryk Memorial, and he donated it back to the government. And um, uh, it wasn't until 1949 that the piece was completed and placed at Midway Plaisance in Chicago. Uh, he did in 1942, there was a, obviously a huge metal shortage, uh, any castings had to be approved by the American government. So he went ahead and um, he did a piece called Mother Crying Over the World. And it was so poignant. It's a mother hovered, huddled over a globe, mourning the loss of her sons, her husbands, her brothers, um, sending them off to war just really grieving the state of the world. And it was so poignant that Albin was 
uh, granted permission by the US government to have this piece cast. Um, but to the original question, it's pretty, it's pretty relative. Um, I don't unfortunately have the figures of what something like the Emily Fountain ha cost to have cast in 1961, but I do know that today, um, if you're having a mold made to have it cast, the bronze work alone is close to $30,000 to have an Emily Fountain done. Um, since we were talking about all of that and anatomy, something that is really interesting, I always find interesting about Alvin's work is um, he was notorious for scribbling on whatever piece of paper he had lying around. Um, he would draw on the backs of bank statements, letters, really whatever he could find. Um, so the skeleton piece is actually on the back of um, a piece of Albin stationery. And Catherine is going to go over there and flip it so that you can see it because when I get far away, no one can hear me anymore. <laughs> And it's almost kind of rare because there's really nothing else on the back of this paper. Uh, half the time he does a sketch on the front and then he'll do a sketch on the back. Um, and it's a little bit haphazard and then it's hard to figure out which side you actually want to display when it comes down to framing things. Thank you. Um, the last piece that I pulled, I do have uh, the sketchbooks close by that I can grab more things if there's more things that you want to see. But um, this last piece that I pulled is actually a clay model of Alvin's piece, Primeval Struggle. Um, the original bronze is in the Czech Republic. It is out front of Alvin's essentially elementary school. And um, it represents, it's a man fighting a wolf. And it represents the Czech people fighting against communism and oppression throughout their history because unfortunately, that was pretty much their entire history for most of Alvin's life. They were always being occupied by someone. Um, and we have a fiberglass version of this in our garden that um, our former curator, Rachel Frisbee, actually painted to look just like the bronze version that is in the Czech Republic. Um, but this little clay version is one of the originals that Alvin did, and he'd actually been working on this piece for a little while. He had kind of been planning it, and he had some sketches, um, but he didn't really know where to go with it. So um, in 1930, when he was home for Christmas in French Dot, he um, he had an idea and he actually uh, was working on this. He did the sketches for it. It's a primitive Slavic figure. Um, you can kind of see the, it's a very rough clay um, maquette, but you can see the flowing hair and you can still even see some of the um, precise anatomy and the muscles and the arms and a little bit in the face. Um, and even in the wolf, you can see the muscles and the tension in his body. Um, so he did some sketches, but he wasn't, he was kind of having a hard time with the wolf. Humans, he could sketch, he could sculpt, he could do it all from memory without even having a model. Animals, not so much. So um, he essentially went to the zoo and found some wolves and he used them as his models. And he would go and he would visit them and he would sketch um, until he had enough sketches that he could put together to create this ferocious attacking animal. Um, and it is very special. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of these clay models. Um, they usually get destroyed because they're like this. They're little um, versions that are done for a commission he would create a little um, clay model. Sometimes he'd have it cast in plaster. Sometimes he'd have a miniature done in bronze to present to a committee 
um, for commission to basically get approval so that they could do the full size version. Um, and then when the full size versions were done, casting it, doing the mold, a lot of the time the clay gets destroyed. The original version is lost. Um, so it's always exciting when we have these in the collection. Like I said, we really only have a few of them. Um, and this is one of the special ones. Hopefully, uh, it will be on display this fall, um, late October through early December uh, is our 60th anniversary exhibition. It's called Album Polashic Destiny Fulfilled. And for this, we are pulling things from the collection. It's a complete collection show. Um, paintings that are never on display, sculptures that are never on display. Um, some of the archival items that are able to be out, um, as I'm sure you know, archival pieces are incredibly fragile, uh, especially works on paper. Uh, it's very difficult to have them on display with light and the temperature and humidity have to pretty much not move at all. It has to be incredibly consistent so that things don't get shocked so that things don't get damaged. Um, so this is a great opportunity for things like this so that people can see some of the pieces, especially the letters and drawings that normally could never be out on display. Uh, but hopefully for that exhibit, I'm hoping I've, we've got some drawings that can be framed, can be out on display. So those will hopefully be out um, as well as some other pieces from the collection, some paintings that haven't been seen in probably 60 years. Um, but that's pretty much what we have to share. Does anybody have any questions? It doesn't have to be about what you saw tonight. It can be about Palashik, it can be about archives, anything. Uh, will the coin pieces be on display? Um, yeah, we actually recently, during COVID, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, during COVID, um, when we were closed, we actually had a new metal cabinet made. So um, we had a display case that we never used. And um, we, had a new door made for it. So we actually are able to have some of the medals that Alvin was awarded throughout his career on display all the time now. Um, we do rotate them out because we have quite a few of them. Um, but we keep, I think I try to keep about 12 on display at a time. The Widener gold medal, because it is so fragile, um, it, we will only be out on display for things like this. It won't be in the Palashik exhibit. Uh, it'll probably be out next year uh, again for Titanic Week, as I call it. It's also, I learned this year, April 15th was also International, was it International Sculpture Day? It was International Sculpture Day and I was running around saying it's also Titanic Day. So that's where I'm at. Um, was he from a large family? Yes. He was, he had, he was one of seven. He was a, from a very large family. Um, he only had one sister, her name was Anna. She was the youngest, she was younger than him. And um, he had a lot of brothers, most of which were, they all had different trades, two were pastors in the United States. Um, he had a brother who was a tanner uh, for leather. Alvin toyed with that for a little while. His mother said no, because they already had a child who did that. Um, but he was from a very big family. His family actually owned an inn in French Dot, where he is from. And um, his father passed away when he was young. So it was really just his siblings and his mom were left to keep his business running. And um, Alvin wasn't really big on the family business. Uh, our nativity, or his nativity, I should say, uh, which is the oldest piece in our collection, is on constant display in the historic home. It's completely carved by hand, painted with organic materials. Um, he started it when he was about 13 years old. And really, whenever he had a chance 
to kind of get away from his mother and hide. He would hide under a table and he would work on it. Um, so that if that kind of gives you a glimpse into the size of his family and kind of the chaos. Um, do any of his pieces travel to other museums? Do they always stay at the Winter Park location? For the most part, they stay here. Um, we have loaned pieces in the past. Um, it's kind of rare to loan pieces for us, mainly because it's sculpture and um, sculpture is a lot harder to pack up and ship around than paintings are, um, but it does happen. We had some pieces several years ago before I was the curator that went to the National Czech Czechoslovak Museum uh, up north for an exhibition that they did. Um, but it's definitely always an option. Uh, we have, there are Polashic pieces all over the world. And um, I really, hopefully someday, love to work with either PAFA or the Art Institute in Chicago to do some kind of huge Polashic retrospective. Because as we're researching, we're finding more of his pieces. Um, we're finding castings that have been made that no one ever knew about. Um, but for the most part, things kind of stay here. We're pretty protective of our collection. And like I said, it's, um, it's harder to pack these things up and ship them. Excuse me. So plus if they're damaged, um, paintings can kind of be, they can't always be fixed, but sometimes they can be fixed where sculptures, you kind of got to start from scratch if something happens to it. Um, someone has Albin. Resurrection. Oh yeah, yeah, his Victorious Christ. That's one of his most popular pieces. We have one in the garden, we have one in the house, and then we have the little resin versions that we sell in the gift shop that people always come in looking for. I love those little things. Um, will the US nickel plaster cast be on display, the one from the competition? It's possible. Um, I was actually looking at that this afternoon. Um, there's a really good chance that it'll be in the uh, Polashic exhibition this year. I'm trying to pull things for that exhibit that have never really been displayed. Um, I have to look, uh, David, we might actually have the, I think we have the drawing for that too. Um, Titanic Adventure. Hmm. A lot of stuff coming in. Yes, we have a lot of Titanic connections. Well, we have the two Titanic connections. Um, but I'm always looking for more. I would, I go through the collection all the time hoping that I find more connections. Um, we actually, we have some volunteers that have Titanic connections, which is fascinating to me. They, when they um, started finding out how I'm kind of obsessed with it, uh, they were telling me like they had family members or they're related to people who were on it. Um, and actually, uh, one of my grandmothers, I think it was my grandmother's, uh, cousins was an electrician on the ship and one of the sconces wasn't working in Belfast and he took it off and took it home. So somebody, that thing's floating around somewhere. Um, Sorry, I'm getting notes. Uh, are there any other questions? But yes, Carol, I like that idea. I'm happy to do a Titanic Q&A about Albin. That'd be fun. We should do that. Um, but if there's no more questions, uh, thank you for having us. Thank you for letting us do this. Um, if you haven't been to the Polashik exhibit, please come visit. Um, right now, we have the exhibition. It's Cynthia Holmes Sweet Surrealism is what's in our gallery right now. Cynthia is a local artist. She's a surrealist. Um, her work is gorgeous, and it's bright and colorful and whimsical. Uh, we also have a scavenger hunt that we made for children, but adults are welcome to do it as well to find different things in her pieces. And actually, next Tuesday, we are going to be doing a live stream gallery tour and Q&A with Cynthia, 
in our gallery. So she'll be walking around discussing her paintings and, and answering questions along, along the way. If anyone wants to join us for that, that'll be on our Facebook Live. Um, but if nobody has any other questions, I don't know, Josh, do you have any questions? Hold on, I can't hear you. That was my fault, <laughs> not me, but thank you so much for, for coming out today. Um, I really appreciate it. I thought it was all really mm -hmm. fascinating information and just really cool to get a peek behind the curtain. Uh, do, oh, I guess can't, uh, you can't hear me. Uh, apologies if that's, if I'm not coming through. Um, but yeah. Oh. Is it, am I coming through? Well, um, sorry about that, folks. Hello? Sorry, I was popping your pass because I couldn't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Well, I, I just was uh, just, just thanking you uh, and basically asking, uh, just letting you know that it was a fascinating uh, peek behind the curtain. Um, I think we had a lot of folks here in the audience who uh, really, really enjoyed it and were able to uh, to uh, to see um, stuff that they've never really had the opportunity to. Uh, yeah, uh, I agree, David. There are some fantastic pieces uh, back here, and uh, kind of going into the uh, underground at the house here down downstairs uh, and and seeing behind uh, the venue uh, is also really cool. So thank you so much for for coming out today. And, uh, and folks, Absolutely. thank you all for attending. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, if you uh, have any other uh, interest, please visit that, um, the, the website, the, the polshek.org. Uh, um, and you can also check out their Facebook page. I am going to try to uh, uh, share that here as well, because I will probably be in attendance for the um, for the surrealism uh, exhibit tour, because I saw that initially when I was looking up the uh, uh, the 60th anniversary and all the cool stuff that you guys are doing. So, um, yeah, I think that's, that's awesome. Um, and yeah, thank you all so much. Um, if you guys wouldn't mind filling out the survey as well that we put out here today, um, please do. Uh, it really helps us get an idea of what you in the audience would like to see next. Uh, if you want to see, uh, more from the Polish Tech Museum or anything else, please just let us know. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. And uh, thank you so much, Emily, Catherine, and Caitlin for bringing this uh, production to us. Uh, I, we, we really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having us. Yeah. Awesome, and thank, thank you everyone for coming and I hope you all have a fantastic night. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to be the first to find out when we have new fun and informative videos for you. Orange County Library System is your place to learn, grow, connect. Yes. Yes. Okay.